For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that, one e that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope that it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in the right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them that was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he, has not, and he has committed us to the message of rec reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore, we implore, you, sorry, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled, God. God made him had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Travelling north the other day, I stopped for some coffee at a roadside cafe and, entirely by accident, happened to overhear an intriguing conversation that was taking place on the table next to me. Uh, you know how it is, you don't intend to eavesdrop, but uh, in the intimacy of the little chef, you uh, can hardly avoid being drawn into a neighbourhood conversation. And one man was briefing another on how to sell insurance. And for me, it was quite illuminating. I picked up a number of tips for the next time an insurance salesman comes to my door. <laughs> and the older businessman was instructing a younger man about the color of tie he should wear, about the suit he should wear if it's in the city, and the suit he should wear if it's in a village, about the approach he should take if it's a man who answers the door, or if it's a woman who answers the door, whether he should sit or stand in making his final sales pitch in the living room, it really was quite intriguing to hear this conversation going on. And when the younger man expressed some doubt, as I saw him, about the techniques that he was being encouraged to adopt, the older businessman said to him, and now I quote, that this was necessary if he was going to make it. That was the phrase. Now, there's nothing particularly unique about that approach. It can often be part of today's commercial life. Now, the profit motive is legitimate enough, but what I found as I listened to that, what I found was rather distasteful about the conversation, was the manipulative manner that this young salesman was being encouraged to adopt. This blatant emphasis on self-advancement. He was going to do this if he was going to make it. So the emphasis certainly was not on the customer. The emphasis was on personal prestige, on advancement, on making it. Now, part of the background to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians was that Paul was being criticized by some people in Corinth as if he was in Christian ministry solely for personal gain. There were some people in the church who said he was trying to build his own reputation. He was out in Christian ministry simply for his own prestige. He was a control freak who was manipulating people in order to build his power base and extend his own personal empire. And so Paul is very deliberate in this letter in 2 Corinthians in replying to those kinds of accusations. And he says, I'm not going to fall into the trap of boasting about my own achievements. 
chapter 3, verse 1, he says, I'm not going to write a testimonial on my own behalf. And in fact, he says, I'm not the slightest bit interested in personal image. We read verse 12 together. Have a look at that if your Bible is open. I hope it is. Verse 12, we are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, he says. His critics in Corinth had a distorted sense of values. They were the people who gloried in appearance. They were the ones who boasted in their position. They were the ones who took pride in what is seen. But Paul says in chapter 4, the previous chapter, that uh, all of those judgments are superficial. That kind of value system, which looks on the outside, is empty. Someone who's called to serve God, someone who is called to live under Christ's lordship, is governed by entirely different values and motives. I think I mentioned last year an interview that uh, I carried out on behalf of another Christian organization for a young man who was applying uh, to serve in what we sometimes call full-time Christian work. And in the course of this discussion, I asked him what were the main reasons why he was interested in uh, Christian ministry of this kind. He said, well, there are two main reasons. Uh, first of all, I'd like to travel around Europe. And secondly, I'd like to be financially secure. <laughs> and uh, we had to talk a little bit about those fundamental motivations for full-time Christian service. Most of us recognize it's not only naive in its expectation, but it's very self-centered in its orientation. Now, Paul had not given his life to personal interests. He had given everything he had to the cause of Jesus Christ. He was willing to face all kinds of hardship for the sake of serving the Lord and serving the kingdom priorities. And the key to understanding this man's commitment is to understand what motivated him. What were the real springs of his action? So it's my suggestion this evening as we just look at these verses for a few moments that living under Christ's lordship is the result of entirely new motivations in our lives. And understanding these motivations would be essential if we're going to cope with all of the ups and downs in our Christian service, which I guarantee we will all confront as soon as we're home. Every Christian committed to serve Jesus will find themselves under a ceaseless temptation to give up, to throw in the towel. And therefore, it's essential that we know why we do what we do. What are our motivations? What are our fundamental incentives for giving our lives to Jesus, having him control us? So I offer to you from these verses three fundamental motives. They each appear in this passage as Paul explains what really matters in his life and his ministry. The first motivation for living under Jesus' lordship is this. We are loved by Jesus our Savior. We are loved by Jesus our Savior. Verse 14, very well-known verse. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Uh, J.B. Phillips paraphrased, the very spring of our action is the love of Christ. And the first reason for wholehearted service for Jesus Christ is not, first of all, our own sense of guilt. It's not, first of all, the need which is out there. It's not, first of all, our own personal ambition or our own hope for self-advancement. The first reason for serving Christ wholeheartedly is because we are loved. We are pushed forward, Paul says, in our service by the compulsion of Christ's love. That's the tone of verse 14, that Christ's love compels us. It's a gentle and a firm pressure pushing us forward in serving Christ. Now, some years ago, I uh, had a 10-hour canoe journey. It was on one of the lakes in Poland, up in the north. I was with a bunch of students. And we began on a huge lake. It was a beautiful summer's day like today. Uh, there wasn't a ripple on the water. It was beautifully calm, and the canoeing was incredibly leisurely. But as we went on, after a few hours, the lake began to narrow like this. It became a river. In the end, it became a fairly fast-flowing stream. And finally, a fairly rapidly moving gorge, which took these uh, canoes through the undergrowth and on. And what was happening there as the banks came in, that they were exerting this gentle and firm pressure, and the water therefore was flowing more rapidly, and the canoes were lifted up, and off we went. And that's the thought which Paul is expressing here with a powerful piece of logic in verses 14 and 15. He says, Christ's love compels us forward 
in our commitment to serve Jesus, if you just follow verses 14 to 15, you'll see how he puts these pieces together. First of all, he says, Christ died for all. Christ's love compels us because Christ died for all. He's the savior of the world. All men and women, irrespective of their culture or their background, can know salvation through Jesus Christ as they put their trust in him. And we make it personal. Christ died for me. As many of us heard on Tuesday night when David Coffey was speaking, the most personal statement that Paul gave in Galatians 2, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then the logic continues, if you look at verse 14, therefore all died. I think in the light of the next verse, you can say that's best understood to mean, therefore it is death to my old way of life. It is death to my sinful life. It is death to a self-centered life. And the logic continues in verse, four, in verse 15, follow this very carefully, that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So because of that sequence, Paul says, now the center of gravity in my life is no longer self-interest. It is the service of Christ who's given everything for me, the Son of God who loved me, he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him. So the New English Bible actually uh, translates verse 14 in this way. The love of Christ leaves me no choice. It is this kind of compulsion. I spoke to a young man not long ago. Uh, he's from my, my own city, Oxford, and he uh, decided to go and serve God in Yakutsk in Siberia. It's a very remote city up in the Arctic Circle, and I need to say, just in case you're interested, that IFES can send you there. So if you are interested, uh, see me afterwards. A few people have actually come back. And uh, as he's served God <laughs> in Siberia, um, I asked him what it was that motivated him to be there. After all, uh, Yakutsk, it's, it's up in the Arctic Circle. In the winter, the temperatures drop to about minus 60. It is uh, the capital of a huge area the size of India. It's called Yakutia. There are hardly any Christians there. It's the center for Baha'i, for all kinds of other cults. There's very little Christian support. It's very expensive. It's ugly. It's gray. It's inhospitable. After you've been there a couple of weeks, the excitement tends to wear off. So why did this guy with a very good Oxford degree bury himself in Yakutsk? I mean, it's hardly a smart move in terms of career advancement. And his reply was very, very simple. It was simply the joy of seeing other people meet Jesus Christ. He said, it was the joy of seeing the gospel transform the desperate young people in that city. It was his awareness of the fact that his own life had been radically changed by God's love in Jesus. And that was not just personal, as verse 14 expresses. Christ died for all. So for him, and I hope for all of us in this tent, the logic was very clear. Jesus gave himself for me. He gave everything he had. So now I no longer live for myself, as Paul puts it. And if we're tempted to uh, bring our lives under the control of personal desires or our own ambitions, or if we're asked who or what is in control of our lives, our reply, if we're compelled by Jesus' love, should be what Paul puts in verse 15. I no longer live for myself but for Christ who died for me and rose again. Quite recently, at one of our conferences in East Asia, a young graduate got up to give his testimony of what it meant to live under the lordship of Jesus in his professional life. He uh, was living in a country where corruption and bribery were endemic. And he was uh, working, he was a manager of an electricity supply company. And one day, as he said in his testimony, Two men came to him and they offered him a very large bribe if he would award them a contract. And so he said to them, no, I can't do that. I'm a I'm committed Christian. I believe in righteousness and justice. I can't accept a bribe. Well, about a week later, these two men returned. And instead of offering a bribe, they threatened violence to him. They said, if you don't award this contract to us, we can't be responsible for what might happen to you. And again, this young man stood his ground and said, no, I can't accept that. 
I can't, uh, whatever you may threaten, I cannot give way. Well, a week later, they came for the third time. And this time, as I put myself in his own shoes, it must have been much more difficult, they threatened injury to his wife and to his young children. If you don't award us this contract, something will happen to your family. So he went back home and he discussed it with his wife and with his pastor. And they all agreed that he should stand his ground. So when they came to him again, he said to them this, I've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you can offer me more than that, I'll take it. And those two men were so overwhelmed by that response that they actually withdrew their threat. The sad thing about the story, actually, is that one of those two men was from an evangelical background, the other was from a Catholic background. And when they heard those words, they just disappeared. And uh, when the graduates at the conference in East Asia heard this young man say what he said, they stood on their chairs to cheer him. A bit like late night, actually, I thought, because... They were so heartened that he was a Christian who was willing to stand up and be counted. He was a Christian who was going to march to a different drum. He was a Christian who took Jesus and his values of the kingdom seriously, irrespective of what the cost might have been. He was a man who was living under his control, under Jesus' control. All of those people gathered in East Asia actually were living in societies where living for Jesus in that kind of way can be extremely costly in day-to-day -day living. Now, I think it will be true for many of us here. I do think it will be true for someone, many of us, listening to my voice, whether in this tent or on cassette. If you say you stand up for Jesus, that Jesus is in control of your life, in every area, in your business, in your work, in your family, in your school, in your university, it might threaten your career prospects, it might threaten your prospects of marriage, it might threaten your hope to earn the kind of money that other people make. But what Paul says here is we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We're called to live our lives for him. So the first great incentive that I take from these verses for living under Christ's lordship, the first motivating force in Christian service of any kind is that we are loved by Jesus our Savior. That's what we're celebrating this evening. We are loved by Jesus our Savior. And because he shed his blood for me, I no longer live for myself, but for him who died and rose again. I hope that will be burned into our hearts and minds, even as we break bread. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I will do anything for Jesus. I hope you say that. The second great motivating force that drove Paul forward is something that we don't often talk about, but our section, which Emily read, began at verse 10. You'll notice NIV actually begins the paragraph at 11. But verse 10... And my second theme is this, we're not only loved by Jesus our Savior, we are responsible to Jesus our judge. We are responsible to Jesus our judge. Look at verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now in the last century, the China Inland Mission, as it was called, was born out of the agony of heart of one man, a man called Hudson Taylor. And he wrote a journal. Many of you will have read parts of this journal, I'm sure. And on one particular day in June 1865, Hudson Taylor describes how he was in a church with a large congregation on a Sunday morning in Brighton on the south coast of England. And halfway through the service, he picked up his hat and he stormed out of the church. And this is what he wrote in his journal. Unable to bear the sight of a congregation of a thousand or more Christian people rejoicing in their own security, while millions were perishing for lack of knowledge, I wandered out onto the sands alone in great spiritual agony. And he describes in his journal how on the beach he prayed for 12 people to join him in that great missionary thrust out into China and beyond. He had this deep concern, you see, about the issues of destiny, he was deeply concerned about the issue of judgment. And that certainly is a very important motivation in our Christian service. It certainly was one of the major forces that pushed people out in the 19th century to serve Christ all around the world. And interestingly, on several occasions this week, a number of speakers from this platform have pointed us to that reality of a world in desperate need because they are under God's judgment. That is a reality and that is a motivating force. 
But you'll notice that what Paul says here in verse 10 is slightly different from that particular emphasis of the judgment of the lost. Here, Paul is saying, we Christians must all face judgment. It is a judgment on our stewardship, as the rest of verse 10 makes clear, if you read it, that each one may receive what is due to him for the deeds done while in the body, whether good or bad. So the judgment which Paul is describing here isn't a judgment concerning our ultimate destiny. It is a time for giving an account of how we have lived our lives. It is a judgment on our stewardship. Now I think this verse is best understood if we place it alongside the verses which Charles quoted here on uh, Monday night from 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul was te uh, teaching there the importance of building our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He says there is one foundation. If you build your life on Jesus, you are absolutely sure and certain. Your destiny is secure if you are built on Jesus Christ. But the question is, how do you build on that foundation? You can either build with those things which are temporary, which just disappear, wood, hay, and stubble, he says, or you can build your life with those things which are of lasting value, with gold, with silver, with precious stones. Because one day, the quality of our building work is going to be tested. And on that judgment day, as he hints in verse 10, the question is, is it just going to disappear in a cloud of smoke, or will it last into eternity? Well, the point is very clear. How you build matters. How you live your life now matters. And Paul refers to the fact that the judgment we will face on that day will be a very practical one for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Everything will be out in the open. And that judgment day for Christians, you see, is not intended to cloud our hope or uh, diminish our sense of joy at seeing Jesus and what we've been singing about on that great day, that isn't Paul's intention. What he's trying to do here is to save us from underestimating the obligation to live for Jesus here and now, to live our lives under his control, to give our lives now for something that will last into eternity. So a verse like this pushes me to ask, how am I using my time? How am I using my gifts or the resources or all of the many God-given opportunities which come our way. All of these things matter, Paul says, in the light of the future. We are responsible to Jesus, our judge. So for some of you who might be 14, 15, 17, 19, 23, God willing, many years ahead of you, will you look back on your lives when you're my age, or maybe even older than me, and see that what you've built is just temporary. You've just been in it for self-advancement, and it's going to disappear in a cloud of smoke. Or will you say, no, what I've given my energies to in the last 40, 50 years, what I've done has, by God's grace, built something that will last, something that goes on into eternity. You see, what Paul is saying here is this is a stimulus to give your life to Jesus in such a way it, to, to live for those kingdom values, those kingdom priorities, so that all that we're doing is contributing to that eternal kingdom. You know, I love the uh, twin parables that Jesus told, and I think that uh, peak time have been looking at them in Matthew 13, especially the twin parable of the uh, farmer and the pearl freak. I think you've done that one, is that right? Yes, good. And uh, in those twin parables... You'll remember the story. They're relatively simple, and Peter also quoted them on Wednesday. The farmer who uh, was one day farming discovers the treasure in the field, covers it up, goes back home, sells everything in order to buy the field, in other words, to buy the treasure. And the twin parable of the pearl freak who uh, was constantly collecting pearls and one day came across the pearl to end all pearls. It was the smoothest, the roundest, the purest, the largest pearl he'd ever seen. So again, he went off home, uh, he sold everything he had. He sold his house, he sold his servants, he sold his CDs, he sold his pearl collection for that one pearl. And if you're tempted when reading that to think, well, that was, must have been quite an incredible sacrifice for the farmer or the pearl freak to give up everything, Jesus says, oh, no, they didn't see it like that at all. In fact, in Matthew, it says that they went, the farmer went and out of joy. 
he sold everything. You know, there's something reckless, wholehearted, joyful about these two men who got rid of everything else to get the treasure, to get the pearl. The whole point was they realized it was worth it. They weren't giving up anything. There was no sacrifice as far as they were concerned. They were going to give, some, give their lives away for something that would last forever. So Paul says, be good stewards of your lives. Give your life for something worthwhile. Be a good builder. Give your energies to kingdom priorities. I took a journey not long ago uh, with a young man, and we were journeying from Leicester to London by car on the uh, M1, and he just graduated in economics. So I said to him, well, what do you plan to do with your life? And uh, I didn't need to ask another question. His reply virtually took us that entire length of the M1 from Leicester to London because he had the whole thing mapped out. He was going to join the NatWest Bank, and uh, he knew everything about the route that he was going to follow in a village desk, a city desk, a foreign desk, investments, management. I know a great deal about the NatWest career path as a result of that. You see, this man actually was dominated by what these days is called a career ego. Uh, he had everything. He was a believer. He had it marked out completely, this upwardly mobile progression through the NatWest Bank. Now, let me make it very clear. I am absolutely sure that what we need are Christians committed to get to the top in the banking profession. We need Christians in business. We need Christians in politics. We need Christians in social administration. We need Christians in youth work and in the pastorate. We need Christians in all of these areas of society. But the ambition to be the best that I can be should be driven not by the hope of materialistic gain, not by the hope of self-advancement, but by our desire to live wholeheartedly for the kingdom, to live for Jesus Christ, who is our savior and our judge, to give everything we have, all of our energies and our capacities, for that kingdom to build for something that will last, whether it's in banking or in politics or in the church or in the home, wherever God calls us. We are responsible to Jesus, our judge. What's going to last when we face Jesus? I have, over the past five or six years, kept in touch with brothers and sisters in Rwanda and Burundi. And uh, many of our friends and believers and colleagues, uh, certainly in, in, uh, in my own work in IFES, uh, categorically refused to divide over that Hutu-Tutsi issue during the genocide. They stood their ground on the basis of the kingdom values of forgiveness and reconciliation. And many of them lost their lives because they were committed to Jesus and committed to one another. The one person who didn't lose his life in Rwanda, one of our, the only staff member left actually, Antoine, was with his family in the refugee camps in Rwanda. And some of my colleagues raised some money and sent him a fax and said, we've got the money, we can fly you and your family out of those refugee camps. And he faxed back and said, no, uh, I'm not coming, we're going to go back to the refugee camps. And the line in his fax was, if I cannot share my people's pain, I cannot share the gospel with them. And when I saw that fact, it struck me, there's nothing half-hearted, there's nothing double-minded about that kind of reply. So here was somebody whose focus was sharp, whose priorities were clear, who'd given his energies and his ambitions, his whole life, his family, to living under Jesus' lordship, to live for kingdom priorities, to give his life because Jesus had given his life for him. And he was controlled not by a desire for personal security or for comfort. He was controlled by God's purposes. So my brothers and sisters, I say to you as I say to myself, we are called to live our lives wholeheartedly with that future in view. We are loved by Jesus our Savior. We are responsible to Jesus our judge. And finally, the third great motive which we have in these verses is another very well-known verse. It's verse 20. We are sent by Jesus our King. We are sent by Jesus our King. We are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now this is the wonderful passage where he describes what it means to be brought back to God in this great exchange which we've been hearing about this week. How Jesus takes away our sin, places his righteousness upon us. We're reconciled, brought back into the family. So Paul says, if that's true, if now I'm a new person, the old has gone, the new has come, 
Well, now I've been given a ministry of reconciliation. I've been called by God to go out and proclaim that wonderful message which a desperately broken world needs. And he says, we are ambassadors. He uses this very bold analogy. We are the king's envoy. In fact, he actually says we are speaking on behalf of God. It's an incredible statement there in verse 20. It is as though God were making his appeal in this world through us. We are speaking, he says in verse 20, we speak on Christ's behalf. Now, it's not at all uncommon for us Christians these days. I'm sure you've been asked this if you try to witness to the Lord Jesus. It's not at all uncommon for us to be asked, why are you so arrogant, you Christians? So arrogant to claim that this gospel is for every person, for every culture, for every part of the globe. What gives you the right? Have you heard that? Oh, it's okay for you. It's all right for you English. It's all right for you Caucasians. But don't try to absolutize this message. Don't try to universalize it. What right have you to impose this message about Jesus on the whole world? And it's a very good question. It's a good question in a world of pluralism. And I think it's going to be a growing challenge to us. Are we ready for wholehearted commitments to Jesus the King in a world where there are many other claims to truth? In the UK, there are now 1.5 million Muslims. There are more Muslims here in the UK than there are communicant members of the Church of England. I lived for some years in a city in the English Midlands which has the largest Hindu population in the world outside of India, or the second largest Hindu population outside of India. It's the city of Leicester. And all around us, there are New Age activities, Buddhism on the increase in our country, the rise of the occult, all kinds of superstitions. And our society, our neighborhoods, our schools are very different from a few years ago. And so these verses here, the way Paul writes this, help us a great deal to respond with conviction to that question, what right do you have? Christians are called to proclaim that Christ died for all, verse 14. And the basis of their authority is that they speak, verse 20, on Christ's behalf. They are sent by Jesus, the king of this universe. Now, of course, especially today, this has to be done with humility. It has to be done with great sensitivity in all kinds of cultures where we're working, even in our own street or our own community. There must be that kind of humility and sensitivity and compassion. But we should never shrink from the task of proclaiming Jesus Christ with boldness. We should never be intimidated by today's religious pluralism. We are sent by Jesus the King. And Paul here is very clear. It's a message for all, verse 14. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that Christ died for all. So he sends us to all. He sends us wherever it is we go back tomorrow morning. Wherever in the globe God calls us. This ministry of reconciliation, which the world so desperately needs to see and experience, is founded on the fact that we are sent by Jesus our King. That's the authority for our calling and for our mission. We submit to that King, and he sends us out. The other thing to notice about that verse is this very unusual juxtaposition. You see where he says in verse 20, he says, we implore, we beg, so the appeal which we are making to men and women to be reconciled, you see, is not made with some kind of professionalism. It's not made with impersonal detachment. Paul, even though he says he's an ambassador, doesn't stand on his dignity. He's down on his knees. He's begging. He's appealing. He's urging people, be reconciled to God. So there's a, an urgency about this. There's a passion about the way in which Paul is writing. So those two things go together, authority and urgency. We are sent by Jesus our King. So our Christian calling, what God is sending us out to do from this convention is founded on that great third motivation. We are sent by Jesus our King with authority and with urgency. We live our lives under the authority of the King of the universe. Now I'm convinced that what most of us need as brothers and sisters in this family, as we look at the challenge that God is giving us to serve him in this country or elsewhere, what most of us need 
is not a new strategy, but a new inspiration. Our lives are not under the control of our own selfish interests, Paul says. Our lives are not under the control of a set of propositions or even a systematic theology or even a set of edicts from some denominational headquarters. Our lives are under the control of a person, Jesus Christ, who has made us new, who gave himself for us. I love the words of John Stott when he was writing on the place of mission in the church and this is what he said listen very carefully to these words nothing is more important for the recovery of the church's mission where it's been lost or its development where it's been weak than a fresh clear and comprehensive vision of Jesus Christ where he is demeaned and especially where he is denied in the fullness of his unique person and work the church lacks motivation and direction our morale crumbles, our mission disintegrates. But when we see Jesus, it is enough. We have all the inspiration, incentive, authority, and power that we need. And that's the answer, isn't it? That's the answer to the needs of this fractured world where God sends us. That's the answer to the sense of weakness and brokenness in our own lives. It is Jesus who died and rose again. There can be no greater motivation to live our lives than this. If we have Jesus, we have enough. So as we conclude this week at Keswick, and as in a moment we come around the Lord's table, this is the question that's in front of us, actually. Who's in control? What motivates you? What shapes your decisions? What shapes your decisions about money or about the family? or about relationships, or about your work, or your ambitions, or even your retirement. What's pushing you forward? What is lifting you up and carrying you forward? I think a passage such as this, with its clear emphasis on Jesus and the cross, provides us with the key motivation for living under his lordship. When I was about 10, I remember one of the heroic episodes of mission being told to me and to others in our Sunday school. And it was the martyrdom of five young American missionaries by Orca Indians. Do you remember that? Many of us were moved as we heard that story, and I certainly was as a 10-year-old. Motivated by the cross, those five men felt unable to stay at home while tribal peoples elsewhere in the world were ignorant of Jesus. And they went to make God's love known through Jesus, and they paid for it with their lives. And what came across to me in that story was that for those five men, the cross meant that they always believed themselves to be expendable. That was what motivated them. Look again at verse 15. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And as we meet together to celebrate this Jesus, let's surrender our lives again fully to him, whatever it is in the future. Let's surrender our lives to the Jesus who gave everything for us. We are loved by Jesus, our Savior. We are responsible to Jesus, our judge. We are sent by Jesus, our King. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all.